roughly 60% of the world population will will go for for elections in 2024 so in general that's a big year right and and so th there is possibility that e, e as follow through or through your own interest or perhaps out of panel's own curiosity you might encounter questions on indian elections and and that's why it's, it's important to to be aware of it uh, since i've kept a broad canvas for this for this session which which is not just restricted to elections i will i'll also give you some verbatim and some phrasing on how do you handle questions regarding political affairs because that's that's important uh and i i would have said uh out of my own experience that is important but uh, at least in two of the mock pis that i've taken uh people have been cornered badly and they've they've themselves realize that they were bad at handling political questions so it's it's important one one final line to this is that there is uh, a delimitation which is planned uh and it's pending so possibly 2024 uh uh will be the largest or uh, will be the last elections when when you might have the current number of seats that goes for elections. So currently there are around 573 seats that that go for elections. Uh, there's a very high likelihood that the delimitation will happen before the next Lok Sabha elections. And so it also, as an adjacent issue to, to the Lok Sabha elections, becomes an important topic for people to know. So that's that's important. Uh, I see one raised hand. Whoever it is uh, can ask the question. Uh, can you in brief describe like what exactly is delimitation like is it increasing of seats or anything other than that like so, so, yeah delimitation is basically uh it's 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 a common concept across the world wherever elections happen it's kind of redrawing of parliamentary boundaries and assembly boundaries right and why it happens is over a period of time uh, so i think the last delimitation happened somewhere around 2000 one or so uh, or perhaps even before that so what happens is as india has grown the population has increased and it's simply not possible to govern a constituency which is say full of three million four million people right so you have to do a delimitation where you break down the constituency redraw the boundaries of parliamentary and both assembly constituencies to reflect those population changes that have gone and ensure that there is fair representation, right? So that's that's in in general the delimitation uh, for you, right? And India's population has kind of increased over the period of time. Uh, so from what I know, and I it, just double check it, but I think I'm right. The next delimitation exercise is perhaps scheduled for 2026, uh, and it it will alter both the Lok Sabha seats as well as the state Vidhan Sabha seats that 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 go in right now. Why is that issue important? Since someone asked it straightforward, there there is a sense uh, and that the northern parts of India and perhaps the central and parts of India and the eastern parts of India, some eastern states, their population has grown at a faster pace compared to the states like southern state in the southern India to some states in the western India, where they have done really well on population control. So there are contentious issues in, in, in those states, specifically the states in the south, that delimitation would mean that the seat representation would increase for states in the north and some states in the east, which will give them higher leverage when it comes to uh, ensuring national political issues. O obviously, you all know that for example, the largest uh, state when it comes to seats is Uttar Pradesh, uh, with some around 80 seats. Now, with delimitation, that number will become even larger comparatively to states in the south, and they will feel that people who have dominance in the northern and the west, uh, in the eastern part of this country, would have a farther more leverage, and that could prove as a disadvantage to 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 the southern parties. Right? Does that answer the question? Do you have any follow-ups? Yeah. No. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I thanks for asking this. Delimitation uh, is a contentious issue, and that's why I said it's an important thing because uh, it it kind of what what it does is uh, this might be the last political national election when where you uh, you are seeing the current constituencies the way where they are structured, and 
uh, and perhaps the la uh, the seeds uh, where they are right so moving forward how do i change my slide yeah okay. yes yes so to understand what are Lok Sabha elections, I am pretty sure of all the 100 plus people that, that are here, everyone would have an idea about what a Lok Sabha election is. But Lok Sabha elections in India, they are the largest democratic exercise where uh, universal adult franchisee, people above 18 years of age with a proper voting ID cards can cast their vote in their ballot in a secret ballot to determine the composition of the lower house of the parliament which is the lok sabha there is another house of the parliament which is the upper house the rajya sabha and uh, that's why we have a india's bicameral parliament with the lok sabha and the rajya sabha so and it's also the world's largest democratic exercise by the sheer numbers of it right uh, it's conducted simply because of the scale that it is in multiple phases uh, facts you don't need to remember in general I am interviewed, don't expect you, or even the VATs don't expect you to know facts. But still, maybe just for the sake of it, I've written that uh, the last elections were conducted in seven phases, uh, and they are conducted in multiple phases. And uh, by all means, I think May 26, 2019 is when the new government was formed in. So the next government has to form in before that fact. Uh, uh, yeah, they, they are 543. So it's a typo. Please, please correct it. It's not 573. Uh, thanks. Thanks for that correction. Uh, 543 and 272 is the benchmark number. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, the elections would typically happen between April and May uh, because, because the government is due its five year term in May 26 uh, of this year. Uh, voter turnout is a specific issue. Now, why I say th this is a specific issue? Because you might not be asked straight away facts around elections. Okay, People might ask you or panels might ask you creative questions re regarding elections. What do you think are the challenges with Indian elections? What what are the typical challenges with Indian elections? How you can rectify them? What, what is the approach? Do you think that India's election systems need an overhaul? Is India moving into a presidential system of elections? Some some of these lines, not direct uh, questions, but indirect interpretations or indirect references to that question. So, for example, one of the critical challenges that is often connived when it comes to Indian elections is that voter turnout is an issue, especially largely largely in the urban pockets of India, where people simply don't go out and vote in larger numbers, and larger bulk of India's voting happens in the rural pockets. Uh, on this or the suburban pocket so that's perhaps one challenge between uh, when that urban pockets they they are kind of the loudest uh, they complain the most but they they are not the ones who are casting their electoral rights rights to to an extent that they should to to select or deselect the incumbent and get someone else so that's that's one thing as a matter of fact uh, i think 2019 election was around 67 percent uh voter turnout with different varying stages of turnout between different constituencies and states uh the elections in india are largely bipolar uh but you cannot say that so the verbatim would be largely bipolar with two major national parties one the old indian national congress uh and the the Bharatiya Janata Party, the BJP, uh, and then there are regional parties which lend to its multipolarity. So there are several states where the regional parties are really very strong, and that they, they become a strong voice. For example, in states like West Bengal, in states like Tamil Nadu, in states like Telangana, in states like Andhra Pradesh, in states like uh, um, you know Maharashtra and others, where where regional parties are pretty strong. And that lends to itself a certain sort of multipolarity. Bihar also, for example. Now, in this in this aspect, uh, from the states that you come in, you need to be you need to have some sort of awareness around those state politics. For example, if someone comes from Bihar, you should be aware about what what are different sorts of political parties in Bihar. What's the different sort of political sentiment challenges in Bihar and other things. So you need to have some sort of your state knowledge also. Uh, when it comes to uh, the elections, I'm just covering from a larger canvas. Even for Lok Sabha elections, there's there's an expectation 
sometimes what happens is this panel members understand from their sitting and footing they are they are largely sitting from from say 9 or 10 in the morning from the, for the panel to roughly 5 or 6 in the evening so roughly 7 8 hours interviewing 10 to 12 candidates in a single day and most of the candidates have at least some of the answers are very generic in nature so there's often in a sense of boredom uh, or or what what is a monotonous nature that comes in with with an interview so they, they just to give it a different flavor they might be just curious to know uh, maybe so you come from a state say say a candidate comes from a state which is in uh, which is arunachal pradesh or or manipur or meghalaya or west bengal and and the panel members are just simply curious to understand okay what 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 is the state politics about what are your state politics issue how will that determine the national election outcome from your state so they, they might be curious around it and they will ask it sometimes it also happens from a stress interview point of perspective where they want to push you down they they have figured out that you might have a certain ideological inclination and you're pushed down to to contrary views to see how you react to it are you a rigid stubborn person who is not willing to change their views who's not willing to even hear those views so this happened not that i have a lot of rigid views but this happened with me in an xlr ibm interview where simply the panel was in a very fun mood uh, at that time xlr i used to have a gd which which uh, which was a seven eight people gd with all the three panel members were sitting uh, used to evaluate you on a gd and then when 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 i was in the interview room roughly for a 40 minute interview they, they were just having trying to have fun by pushing me around up election issues perhaps even forcing me to answer some of the questions in hindi because i come from a state where my vernacular should be in hindi so so and they were trying to see uh, how how i'm reacting to those situations how i am handling to those situations right and i'll give you some some idea of how to handle that the the election commission of india the eci is the authority which is responsible for conducting and announcing elections uh, most likelihood somewhere around next month or maybe a month after that you will see eci announcing the election and you have 543 seats 272 is the majority required for it roughly i think bjp had both for the last two elections bjp has had a majority in both elections some facts may be out of interest uh, that I can tell you that uh, people might want to draw a parallel between 2024 elections to 2004 elections. Uh, can there be such a scenario uh, or something like that? So 2004 elections, most people know that Congress won and it was a UPA government under Dr. Manmohan Singh that formed the government. But there are some interesting facts around it that even though people might say Congress won that election, uh the the seat difference between the congress and the next big party which was the bjp was just seven seats if i'm right it was 145 seats that the congress won and 138 that the bjp won uh and it was just seven seats but congress was able to stitch and coalition also since they were the largest party they had the first benefit to to stake a claim to that government and they managed to stitch a alliance the upa one and form a government under dr manmohan singh Subsequently, in 2009, they again won it. This time, they had much larger seat compared to the BJP. Uh, they were again able to stitch a coalition and run a government. Since 2014, um, India has seen a single party majority coming in. Though still NDA, the National Democratic Alliance, which is run by the BJP, uh, is part of the government. But largely, it, it's 2014 and again 2019, both have seen single largest party winning uh, winning a sing, uh, winning a single majority, which happened only after. Uh, if if you move to a precedent to that, it it happened only in the 1984 uh, post Indira Gandhi's assassination. After that, India has seen a whole bunch of coalition parties. Uh, a common question that could come as a follow up is, what do you think? A coalition is better or a single party majority is better? And how would you answer that? Would anyone want to take a shot? Anyone unmute and take a shot? Yeah. Yes. Sir. Yeah, I would uh, like like to go with the coalition government because else uh, it will it will seem like a bit uh, like uh, autocratic in nature. Like one single party can do whatever they want to do. If if it would be a coalition government, then uh, the, like the 
party needs to work uh, on the interest of every single party else they can uh, like take down the support and the government may eventually fall okay uh, aslam so, you you can also say that so say your point i believe that a single party would be better because why do you say so because there would be less discussion and more governance and also a stable government will always be good for the economy of the country okay uh, so uh, to, yeah yes go ahead uh, so i would uh, agree with uh, my friend's point uh, actually uh, the problem with coalition government is that they do not come to a certain uh, a certain typical point uh, uh, let's say for example take example of uh, jharkhand and chatisgarh uh, both got uh, like both separated from their initial states in 2000 but uh, when we look at chatisgarh it, it has come much ahead and jharkhand is still present over there very less development in the country uh, main reason is the political situation of uh, the state good so i will stop people here uh, because uh, I, um, I see a lot of uh, let's stop let's stop. i see i see a lot of answers i know th these are these are topics where you will have answers what i what i would demonstrate here is that you will have viewpoints on both sides and you will have pros and cons on both sides right uh, and it's good that you take a side and give facts and evidences to your fact for example the last response that i came in uh, was that there are two adjacent states neighboring states jharkhand and satisgarh and one with a coalition government or a certain political coalition ruling there one has an absolute majority and comparatively an absolute majority has delivered much better when it comes to economic growth or other other sorts of development when it comes to infrastructure uh, other human development indices and not not make sure you know that you don't know an incorrect fact or you don't know even directionally you know that it is better than jharkhand and chhattisgarh right that's that's a good good evidence based answer whereas someone else said a coalition is better because a, a single party majority could become autocratic now, just to say that there could be a lot of follow through questions to that, which you might be asked to different. For example, uh, in the last 10 years that there has been a single party majority in this country, what decisions do you feel were autocratic in nature? Maybe you can give them an example of uh, uh, the current situation where uh, parliament's MPs have been suspended and certain bills have been passed without even proper consultation and debate. But in general, people will follow through you with that, that there were farm laws bills, there were CA, NRC bills that were posited, passed in the parliament, but, but they got reversed because of enough enough uh, turnout on the road and others to... Uh, so in India, there are checks and balances where even a single largest party will have to function with some sort of democratic power only. They cannot simply overturn the entire, entire situation. That being said, uh, interesting evidence that I know for at least, uh, but I would like you to double verify, but at least from uh, yeah, demonetization is an, is, is an example, it's, though it's an executive decision, it's not a legislative decision, uh, but definitely there, there are decisions that single party majority can take, but there are enough examples that they have reversed it also uh, because of opposition and then there is a check in the Rajya Sabha also where, where parties, those who have majority in the Lok Sabha might not have it in Rajya Sabha. But that being said, there is an interesting evidence or data point. I'm not completely sure about it, but I think I re I've read it somewhere where the coalition governments in general in the last uh, millennial, which is the 2000 when it started, uh, have rendered much stronger economic growth compared to a single party majority. Although that will have its own downside as a as a as a fact because uh, people will say that it's it's still not 25 years we have not even completed a quarter of a century uh, so it's hard to make that kind of immediate correlation causation argument there but you can say that coalition has been successful in india uh, avoid avoid taking as someone asked in a comment should we take extreme stand you should take a stand how extreme is extreme is not a stand extreme is the way you express it extreme is the point of view when you say that single party majority is the only way that india could progress hence coalish i would stand with uh, single party majority because that is smooth and that leads to faster decision making and whatnot right that's that's a stand with an extreme view viewpoint you might say that i personally feel that a single party majority is far more effective in governance because they don't have to rely on a multiple 
perhaps even contradictory political interests to appease the coalition partners. That being said, uh, 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 you believe that even a coalition with a strong nucle nucleus could possibly be a be a strong alternative, which because it will also entertain a lot of diversity of perspective, which comes from different coalition partners. So that's a that's a kind of phrasing where you say, okay, this is what I prefer, but yeah, this is how it could possibly also be better. So that's that's how you prefer. So you kind of give a holistic view rather than taking a stand, which is fine, but going to extreme side of taking that stand. I see raised hand. You can ask your questions. Here. Uh, I Whoever. think you answered it. I I just wanted to ask that yeah. uh, can yeah. we uh, be like uh, central and uh, talk about uh, the benefits of both and not say that uh, which one would I prefer like that? Extreme, extreme, extreme viewpoints are anyway not encouraged. At least I would not advise it unless and until you have compelling reasons for you to believe that I am very justified in taking a stand. I would not advise taking an extreme stand uh, because that. Simply in a classroom, that's going to put you at a disadvantage, and that will that will occur in the minds of the panel that this person could have been could take extreme stands even in a classroom and their discussion such topics uh, which are polarizing, and that's not healthy for a for a classroom. So that could work against you. Coming to some All other right. facts, uh, other facts, election commission, it's it's an uh, it's a constitutional body established under the Constitution of India, Article Three Twenty Four. Uh, chief election commissioner is 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 the key authority within the within the election commission. Uh, when it comes to chief election commissioner, uh, why I'm saying if, if this is important? I know people that you know sometimes even institutes that you're part of have election commissions uh, where you are responsible for conducting election. All institute colleges have some sort of their own internal democracy for student leadership. Uh, and if if you have been part of those election commissions or have done their roles you probably would need to know some bit idea around election commission what is their role perhaps know a few famous chief election commission tn session uh, is perhaps one of the most famous names when it comes to uh, election uh, uh, chief election commissioner but you might not directly be asked a factual question on election commission what what you might be asked is possibly what are the challenges that a ECI faces in India? What are the challenges in conducting elections in India? And some prominent challenges, there could be many more, but that even talk about it is in general that there is a, there is a point of view in this country which believes that EVM manipulation can occur. Uh, you're not sure about it completely, but there is a viewpoint uh, by political parties in India that, uh, that EVM manipulation could occur despite ECI introducing something called as a VV pact where a certain percentage of votes through that verified paper audit trails uh, are um, checked to see that EVM and VVPATs are tallying. Uh, and th there is a sense of small distrust that is happening with the election commissions and their conduct conducting of elections. So that's one challenge that you feel. The second one is despite uh, all those limitations and others in place, there is enough usage of cash and other financial means in elections and it has become a, a game of financial muscle power which is demonstrated in both state and national elections uh, and that also creates a high entry barrier for honest candidates with no financial muscle power to contest elections also that that's a that's a second big challenge that you feel in uh, uh, in conducting uh, elections in india when when asked over possible challenges either in a vat or a pi there were some raised hands. If they are still, you can ask. Okay, I think the raised hands are gone. Uh, so, about the 2024 elections, as I told you, it's largely a bipolar. When you say about this election, you will say it's a largely bipolar, uh, largely bipolar election. Okay, I see one more raised hand. Uh, I don't know who has raised it. So, whoever has raised it can ask. You have to unmute and ask because I can't see the chat right now. Uh, I just see a pop up notification that someone has raised a hand. Uh, so I'll just ask you a question. Yeah. Um, so Arya raised a hand. She's, she's saying uh, she's from Delhi University. So can the Delhi University election questions be asked in the interview? Possibly. Yes, very much. Very much. As I said, if you, uh, if you remove, if you, uh, Firstly, if you have been part of 
as a body of conducting elections definitely that could be asked because that's a kind of position of responsibility you held in the college now if you have sufficiently large work experience suppose people with 22 months or more two years or more work experience their their larger pr revolves around their work experience and others but people with less than that work experience they they can be encountered with questions regarding their college life the positions of responsibility the extracurricular activities that they had and if you have been part of election bodies if you have contested elections also that's something as a talking point that you can talk about and they might since delhi university has a very vibrant election ecosystem there might be a lot of follow-up questions around uh, whatever parties i'm not part of delhi universities but at least from the outs outskirts that i've heard and read is there is uh, SFI and other political parties, the youth wings of the BJP, the ABVP and others that contest elections. And it, is, it has a vibrant ecosystem, perhaps a much vibrant ecosystem compared to a lot of other colleges and universities in India when it comes to elections. And there could be possible questions follow through uh, regarding pros and cons, regarding what are the challenges, do you feel the current system serves its need or it's making students more polarized and wasting students' time, uh, which could be better utilized in uh, academics or other uh, other avenues right so there these could be the follow-ups and you can expect them to answer from their own perspective and knowledge right just avoid taking extreme stands uh, and just give you give a holistic pros and cons views regarding it does that answer the question whoever asked it okay i don't see a response so i believe that has answered the question okay so when it comes to indian elections largely as i said it's a bipolar contest between the bjp and the and the, in the national congress but there is a sense of multipolarity that that gets lent in especially from certain states where regional parties are very strong uh, so if you're coming if you're coming from certain states where regional parties are really strong for states like up where samajwadi party and bahujan samaj party are two strong state uh, parties uh, from bihar where rjd and jdu are strong regional parties uh, 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 there, there's also an upcoming possibly an upcoming party still not launched but i think prashant kishore is working on launching some party uh, then there is uh, west bengal where you have tmc you have charkhand where are there's jmm and other parties you have uh, telangana where there is kcrs I, I i think it's called the brs uh, as a as a strong regional party in Andhra Pradesh, there's TDP and YSRCP. Uh, you go down south in Tamil Nadu, there is uh, DMK, AI, DMK. Uh, in in Kerala, I think still Congress, but they've called they, they called something else. I think think they're called the UDF, United Development Front, and then there's the Communist Left LDF as the party. Uh, in in Maharashtra, there's the Shiv Sena and NCP, uh, uh, and I think in, in the Jammu and Kashmir region, there, there is the National Conference and uh, Mehbub Mukti Party, I think the PDP. Uh, in Punjab, there is Aam Aadmi Party and uh, the Akali, Shiromani Akali Dal. So there are states, if you come from these states, there is expectation that you know certain bits about your state parties and other things, right? So that, that's an expectation. Uh, there, there might be a sense of uh, simple out of curiosity. I don't expect this to be uh, a question for maybe an ABC type of an interview, but beyond that, there are there are situations when even there are some some interviews where they ask you to do an extempore on on certain topics, uh, and they might out of curiosity ask, "What do you think? PM Modi is coming back or not?" Now, this is a polarizing question. Some people might have strong views that there is no alternative to PM Modi and he's coming back. Uh, I would suggest keep that strong opinion at your home. Uh, and and make sure that you have a professional diplomatic answer to that situation where you could keep a verbatim that uh, possibly you feel that uh, Prime Minister Modi has a strong chance and BJP has a strong chance because of his popularity to come back to power either as a single largest party once again or a winning uh, as a part of a winning coalition. Uh, you believe that's largely because of his own personal popularity, his go among the masses as well as a lot of welfare scheme like Jal Jeevan missions, uh, you know, housing for uh, for people, clean Swachh India, digital India, and many such policies, the LPDs, the elect electricity connections, uh, the direct benefit transfers that he has done directly based on Adhars and other things. So there are several welfare and mass schemes, mass welfare schemes that have been done by the by the party, which which has made it popular. 
uh, amongst the rural and the underprivileged class and you fully that on top of it there are chances that he will come back or he could come back but at the same time you believe that there is going to be a strong contest because there's a strong coalition that is mustering up against against uh, the bjp uh, which is uh, which is led by the congress and has a lot of regional strong parties and if they if they could work around seat share and if the lingering issues which which are challenges like inflation unemployment maybe some sort of uh, perceived communal polarization uh, happen to be strong issues bjp could face challenges as well right so that's a, that's a good diplomatic pros and cons type driven fact driven stand that you have kind of taken not that okay there is no alternative to be modi or you talk ill about certain opposition leaders and you and, and you draft your answers right uh, that's why i've also listed some pros and some cons of of uh, the current prime minister that uh, they might even follow up what you feel are the downsides of having modi as a prime minister uh, maybe for a third term and you could say things like uh, first of all if you have interest in politics it will be a very different phrasing but there will be people who will have say minor interest in politics she said sir i, I might have minor interest in politics so i don't follow it so strongly but the reading that i have done and the understanding that i have that there is a lot of centralization of power with the prime minister uh, with power concentrated extremely in the hands of the few uh, and that is not good for a democratic setups perhaps also there is a perception that the party favors a certain uh majority uh, and that could have certain perceptions of fear amongst the minority and of course on the economic front the party has is, the country is currently facing inflationary pressures there are issues of unemployment uh, and there are challenges in the country the party is uh, the government has not been able to solve so there are downsides to having him as the uh, potential candidate for a for a prime minister but that being said there are certain upsides also so like if you are asked a direct phrasing about downsides you say okay these are the downsides but yeah there are some good things that also he has done maybe a gst implementation or or whatever whatever you feel there are a lot of good sides to to that as well right or, or the the bottom line being not taking extreme stand then i i know this is a highly polarizing question people in their drawing rooms in their houses would have very strong opinions regarding these issues uh, don't don't let them become uh, or let blurt them out in the in the raw manner that you know right it's it's fine to have those polarizing or those strong views it's completely fine it's a it's a country where everyone has the right to their own views but in a in a setup as professional as an mba interview you need to be as professional uh, as nuanced as holistic as you can be uh economic impact of elections both the, the, the economic impact of conducting elections and there are economic implications of elections as well right uh that could be possibly asked because that's more of interest for business schools and when asked i believe this is more important a topic for vat than pi but in both vat and pi this is asked you could possibly talk about that elections in india over over last few terms and so are becoming some sort of about populist socialist scheme that can put fiscal burden on the state or that can drain financial resources for from the exchequer for example uh, people who would have come from madhya pradesh before the elections there were certain schemes that were targetedly announced for for the women voters if you come if you if i am completely right there have been announcements regarding the farmers and the budgets in the previous 2019 elections that happened where a dbt was announced also to woo the voters there is possibility that large scale infrastructure projects are promised and announced whether it's a metro project whether it's a highway project whether it is setting up a certain corridors economic corridors and all these have financial burdens on the states the large the welfare schemes that are there right again welfare schemes could lead to follow ups where they might want to know your stand what's your stand on a welfare schemes and policies you might have a personal point of view that okay these are bad uh we need to have a full free market economy with a pure capitalist state with no socialist welfare schemes because that's just improper usage of taxpayer money uh but i would advise against that extreme stand rather than you could talk about that yes they put a financial burden on uh, on the exchequer so maybe there could be a time based uh, limit to these policies where these are evaluated after a certain time period a decade or so to see what's the impact that has gained and beneficiaries are re-evaluated again so that people who have made their life 
are moved par- moved away from the receiving benefits from these schemes and not. Uh, but you do believe for a country with a very large economic inequality and a very low GDP per capita and a large population uh, with limited economic resources, such welfare schemes are necessary to ensure that every basic fundamental needs of people are met through. For example, through food grains, but their their hunger is met and through education, uh, their education things are fulfilled, they, they get access to healthcare and all that. So you believe that for a country like India, that is a necessary evil that we might have to embrace, right? Uh, also, uh, a possible economic impact if if an outcome is not favorable right now markets uh, if you're if you're into stock investing and following markets and all there could be questions around it and election impact and right now market is perhaps factoring in through state election results that there is a possibility of a comeback of the current party that is in power and that that could mean policy continuity and markets are kind of bullish and there's a strong sentiment around it but a contrary outcome to that, uh, where the party loses power, the coalition loses powers, and for with some uh, efforts, the other party, uh, other coalition, which is the India coalition, comes to power. Uh, there could be contrary short-term market reactions to that as well. So these are possible questions that you might be asked. If anyone else, if anyone is raising hand uh, till now, you can unmute and ask. Uh, sir, I had a question regarding the same as you mentioned that we shouldn't take the extreme ends. Yeah. But what about the topics that lie in the grey zone? For something like the Ram Mandir issue, it has no proper right or wrong answering to it. Like yes. uh, they can backfire about that uh, it is a cultural heritage site. Then someone saying that the money can could have been used for something else. And with the current government backing on it as one of the main issues or so-called agenda for the next election, how should we tackle questions on such topics which lie in the grey zone? So I will give you an answer for that. Uh, see, if if question has its own grace, you f- need to figure out your own stand first and then see what the phrasing is. For me, on an issue like Ram Mandir, I have a certain viewpoint. And with that viewpoint, if, if I have to put a phrasing to that, uh, I would I would typically say that it's an issue that was decided in the courts of law by the topmost court, the Supreme Court of India, sitting on it and giving a judgment based on facts and their judicial wisdom. So I don't believe that it, this is a political move, political thing which happened. But I do acknowledge the fact that the party in power today has been the political force behind the entire movement, great, creating political mobilization in favor of the temple. And they have kind of created that view for a certain reasons. And you can then give out X, Y, Z reasons. One that you they believe that that the site that that was in dispute was the birthplace of uh, of Lord Sri Ram, uh, which is which is a, who is a prominent deity in 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 Hinduism. And uh, there were historical facts and figures that supported it, and they've led as a political mobilization. But to I would avoid taking it as a political uh question i would say that the courts made a judgment out of it and it's it was courts that decided in the judicial wisdom through following following due laws and processes that the current height which was in dispute should be given back and they should be it belongs to the uh, ram temple uh i think the parties were nirmohi akada and the ram lala virajman so they belong to those parties right uh if, if you are interested, you might know history bits about it. You might say stay around it. Now they might, if if pushed, first of all, such slippery slopes and such questions are rarely asked in interviews because these are contentious topics where even the panel wants to not venture into. But if they venture into, say, the current inauguration that, that the BJP is doing, uh, and is that right or not? Again, your own position will define how your phrasing would be. You could possibly say, firstly, the matter has been settled and decided by the courts in all their judicial wisdom with all due processes. Also, you believe that uh, the current party which is in power has been a political force behind it, uh, making that issue alive, mobilizing people around it. So they, they are becoming the forefront when it comes to inaugurating with all gusto and celebrations and also a large majority in this country celebrates that issue and which is why you're seeing a large scale of fervor 
on on an organic uh, scale uh, within this country so some sort of this phrasing would help you tackle that but i am i'm i'm certainly not sure that they will venture too much into this again if your position is different to that you you possibly could have a different viewpoint also they will respect to that not don't take extreme positions on it that's that's what i that is what i would advise but there could be possible other positions that you can take and you could define your viewpoint on that does that answer your question uh, yes sir actually i got this question from one of my mock pi and he was trying to frame the question in a way that no matter what i say my answer appears to be dented on some other uh, other front which, so which, it, is, which, which, it, it, which it will be see ankit uh, all political questions even even the election questions you can be pushed through even coalition versus single party majority every argument that you will give there will be a counter argument where you, you will be pushed to it right mm -hmm. uh, it, it is on your own firstly you should be clear in your head what is your viewpoint once you are clear with that viewpoint you can defend it you can praise it you can you can even phrase it right so that is more mm -hmm. important there might be loopholes that they will keep pointing out it's it's a see, there will be cases specifically uh, at least i know i am koi and i am lucknu are known to have stress interviews where they will create such stress within you well, whatever you say there is loophole to that and they will bring that out right don't worry on that there is a position and on on the issue that you pointed out a simple position is simply it was a matter that was decided by the courts and the current party is has been a political force behind it uh and which is why that they are they're doing it with all with all uh what what a fervor and enthusiasm that's a that's a simple thing See, on, on a factual basis bjp has been the force behind the ram mandir movement uh they they led the rath yatra they they have reaped political benefits out of it also i'm not denying that as well right now coming on to major issues for elections uh one issue again which is a polarizing one which is rested right away on this slide is uh caste census caste based reservations both are topic for vat as well as topic for pi caste census is an issue that opposition parties have been trying to come up with uh, in fact one of the states released a caste census and there is an increased echo that a caste census should be done so that your reservations are actually mapped to certain the new caste numbers that are in place so the backward caste which are still backward uh, need to need to have wider representation so that there is social justice there's also opposition point of view uh, certain opposition parties including very prominent if you google around that that are also in past have in their uh, announcements hinted towards getting private sector uh, become part of reservation right now it's not part of reservation uh, but private jobs as well become some sort of part of social justice or some some form of affirmative action now this is a slippery slope issue where wherever you sit you will have viewpoint if you sit on the ends where you feel affirmative action has done good to you and is required you will have a very strong viewpoint that a certain set of things are have been open and certain privileges have been enjoyed by certain caste in this country and which has led to a historical disadvantage to certain caste and hence reservation and affirmative action is a necessary policy to correct that two people sitting on the other end of the spectrum might have a very different polarizing view or very different extreme view that reservation is against meritocracy it uh, someone getting a 80% out of an 100% exam and someone getting a 50% and they get to become part of the same program it's a, it's 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 not it's not a justice done to to the one who is working hard it's again meritocracy right no matter where you stand uh, i would avoid uh, uh, where you stand e either for or against this i would say that avoid taking extreme stand and even in a situation like that uh you you could phrase in 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 one possible phrasing of it could be that caste census perhaps could give a good understanding of where the caste currently stand in their uh, in their numbers and other things and ensure an equitable and fair fair representation of those castes in in different sort of sectors uh, including government jobs and other things uh, but at the same time you feel that um, the intended outcomes of the caste based reservations 
have not been perfectly realized in 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 this country and maybe whatever policy that you are framing should be a time bound policy where it it shouldn't appear that a certain certain section which has been part of reservation continues to reap on benefits whether real uh, beneficiaries or who should be the real beneficiaries don't get any benefits out of it so some sort of a middle ground phrasing where you understand that in this country where there has been an historical discrimination to an extent disadvantage to a certain caste there is a need for affirmative action and there is a need for social justice you can't deny that to achieve equality to achieve equity in, in things uh, but at the same time it has to be done in a proper manner with much more thinking beyond what the political parties who get their vote out of a certain caste or certain identities vie for because for them it's they're just optimizing for their own party and their own vote base they will want every single thing for their own party and for their own vote base but for a national level for everyone to uh, operate in harmony and everyone to realize gains out of it it has to be much more strongly thought of of how it has to be done right and they might be questions specifically people coming around bihar that uh, what are what are your opinions on bihar caste census how does it change uh, uh, as a as a resource point of view you could refer to some really good articles on bihar caste census but largely from what i have read on it uh, the caste uh, census says the last which was done in 1931 which was before india became independent has the numbers are largely very same the, the, it, it hasn't changed very drastically for bihar uh, uh, maybe a few uh, castes which are dominant in the state has come up in numbers uh which also historically people know that they have high fertility rates so the numbers have slightly gone up uh, also a certain mobility aspect is also attached to bihar which means certain people have moved out of bihar out of uh, lack of opportunities some because of meritocracy getting good opportunities outside and that is also reflected in the bihar caste census that happened uh and whatever you do avoiding avoiding Uh, avoid taking extreme stand uh, when it comes to issues like caste also and reservations uh, what could be another major issues for 2024 elections is possibly inflation unemployment uh, uh, economic situation globally is is very gloomy uh, you would have heard it from the job market within the ims that you are setting for this year uh, and it is largely because of geopolitics because of very high liquidity which led to inflation and then tightening interest rates that have come in and raised cost of capital which is which has dimmed the economic sentiment so that's true across the globe it's true for india also to an extent right uh, welfare policies of course both both sides in this country now run welfare policies bjp people will say uh, there's one single thing that categorization in india also happens that bjp is a right wing or central right wing and congress is a left wing or central left type of politics and right wing is largely capitalist in nature but despite that bjp on that front has been socialist in nature and they have also had a lot of welfare schemes uh, to an extent there are other parties on the left that have much higher welfare schemes so if you have some examples in your own home states you can give them if you have examples nationally that you are aware of you can give them mandrega is example of one welfare policy that was started by the upa a lot of other welfare dbt schemes that then the, the current dispensation has also done and then there is an issue which which is always prevalent in indian politics which is identity based politics where issues like someone asked could uh, could come in uh, like the religion caste uh, and and different different sorts of identities that exist largely religion and caste uh, that that play around and sometimes state based identities also language based identities also uh, specifically for states which are not predominantly hindi speaking states they have a, they have their own political viewpoint on those so these are identity based politics that could also come in so that being said that covers a larger canvas of the indian election issues that i had to cover with that i will i i think with 5 10 minutes still left in the session i will open that for questions and chat messages that i would have missed because i i do see a notification that it comes in but the, since i am sharing my screen i can cannot see it so wait let me stop sharing my screen and also see if there are chat questions that i could address till then if you have questions you can unmute and ask So I will start seeing the chat messages now. Uh, the first one 
Okay, 75 countries will hold election in 2024. Thank you, Pranav. That's a fact. I will still suggest if you want, you can read the Ruchesh Sharma article. Wait, I will share the link for uh, that article uh, on this chat. Uh, okay. Somebody yes. else has yes. joined with my name and he or she has asked some questions. So please don't pay heed to them. Okay, okay. That's yeah. fine. That's fine. Okay, I, I I think I will share that in Discord. I'm not able to find it. Total seats are 543. That is fine. Abhijat, both have pros and cons. Yes, both have pros and cons. I've told you, you need to take holistic stand viewpoint, right? At the same time, what demonetization? Yeah, you can give demonetization as an example of single party decision. That was an executive decision. Can we, should we take, avoid extreme steps? Like there could be question on farm laws. Though it's an old issue, you might not encounter it, but there could be question on farm laws. There could be largely for this year bias, there could be question on the IPC, the Bharat Nyaya Sahita that they have passed on, uh, which was passed when a lot of MPs were suspended. There could be possible questions on that. How does that change the Indian penal code? What are the pros and what are the cons of it? And I would suggest, you know, do at least a reading of three pros and three cons to it. The three pros that it moves away from a British led system, which was largely. So, so a British led system didn't have an interest of Indians in mind, they had interest of the British uh, people in mind or, or the or the ruling class which were the Brits, right? So their laws were designed that way that in, uh, Indians were not at the center of it. But a ruling uh, country right now, we have to keep Indians at the center of it. And that's where certain laws, maybe I think they have changed sedition and a few other laws need to be changed. And that's what they've done. But there, there are challenges in terms of we as a country, as an administrative system, have been governing on IPC and other things. It's a very big change in terms of our legal uh, phrasing and other things that, that will go through. So there are challenges of implementation that will come around, right? Example of coalition government being better. Example of coalition government being better, uh, I, I, I cannot recall, but I think there's a fact that economic growth uh, during coalitions have been better. But that being said, if NDA 1 was a coalition government. It delivered on a lot of things. If one, some of the landmark acts that that have been in in this country, some some of the acts which really changed the electricity sector, the telecom sectors, uh, what what came during the era of Bharat Ratna Atal Bihari Vajpayee, late by Mr. Atal Bihari Vajpayee, right? Uh, late Mr. Atal Bihari Vajpayee, and uh, that was a coalition red government, right? Uh, they they did nuclear testing. They they fought Cargill and they had they, they did so much thing that was coalition. Even with UPA, the civil nuclear agreement, the Mandrega and a lot of other policies that have come in have come in part of the coalition. So you can say coalition has given enough good policies, right? So that Delhi University, I think I've answered it. A lot of spending Facebook campaign is not taking into account. That's a good point, uh, right? So if you're asked about challenges on, on election commissions, you can say that well, first the usage of cash, usage of financial resources is a big, big challenge for the election commission, uh, as well as a case in point that someone has given that they are, they are not able to even track how social media plays a strong role and how targeted, marketed, paid ad campaigns influence people through social media on a certain point of view. So it's on that's not that's tough to track for election commission of India. Uh, I contested that. Ta, 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 remove that person that's not me someone actually joined it from a wrong name uh good uh, thanks for clarifying that ram mandir rah, 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 rah. yeah this is one of the point I, abhijat you could also possibly say uh on, on the issue if it comes up but given that matter is decided by the supreme court that's a that's a possible line you can take of course the your line and phrasing will decide on where you stand in that viewpoint right i know that okay da, 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 da. But yeah, I, I okay, that's fine. Ankit, thank you for that. Uh, no one, no one, large majority in this country would not be against what is happening. Uh, that being said, uh, uh, always there has to be a professional way of framing things in in government. That uh, and when when you are phrase in sitting in a professional settings, you cannot. Uh, have a similar conversation where that possibly you can have in a friend circle or can they ask questions like topics of work board or a 370 could be a question specifically if you come from a state where you if you are a kp kashmiri pandit or your answer has that point that you know your family migrated i i know 
a lot of I know at least two or three people that migrated out and they use that phrasing in their answers that their families migrated out of Kashmir during the 1991-92 uh, migration that happened uh, for the Kashmiri Pandit. So in that case, you tell me about yourself. Your very genesis of the answer has that so there will be questions around it, right? Even if you come from that state, there could be questions around 370 and other things. Again, what, what is expected, you take a nuanced view out of it. A nuanced view that has some historical element to it and why this being a temporary provision could have been removed as well. So a, a, a point which covers both pros and cons of the decision that happens uh, and explains it in, in a more explanatory way rather than just saying, okay, I have this stand. Uh, the Kashmir is part of India, hence 370 had to be removed. No, that's an extreme stand to win. In that, if asked for opinion, do you first? It depends on uh, on uh, the topic uh, in terms of one nation, one election, where you stand. Uh, a good introdu introduction to that will be all from both sides. Why or would be from a side? Why one nation, one election came as an idea in this country? Because a lot of time is spent on elections a lot of resources are spent on elections so it possibly makes sense to have one nation one election then you start giving the pros of it uh that okay one that one in one goal elections would be done so you will have more time for governance rather than uh campaigning for elections and spending resources on elections but then there will be cons to it the logistical challenges uh and different implementation challenges to one nation one election and then you have those cons as well and then you bring a conclusion where you also take a side uh, and uh, where you also take a side and uh, 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 synthesize all what you have been talking. Will that be a major talking point? Budget in general, not a lot of people are asked, but budget in general is a possible general awareness topic that you need to be aware of. There are sometimes certain times questions around budget, especially for people who have their interviews very near to the budget. Uh, people who have interviews roughly a day before on the day of budget to say two, three days down the budget, it is the strongest current topic that is in place. And if something drastical has been announced in a budget, whether it's a tax reform, whether it's something related, related to a welfare scheme or an infrastructure project or something with, which changes the course of this of the economic growth of this nation, there is a sense of encountering that question in the budget, uh, for in that interview. But as you move away from that event which when the budget is presented, those in, those questions also dim, dim down, right? So if you are going uh, before the budget is presented, uh, two, three days before, there could be questions around what is your expectation? What are in general expectations around the budget? If you're going during the day of budget, there could be questions around it. If you're going after the day of budget, there could be questions around it. How much detail do you need to know? It depends on where you come from. If you come from a field of economics, if you come from a field of government policy and others, or if your work experience is in you know some sort of think tanks and other fields where you do heavily such research and analysis, there is a fair detail that you're expected to know. Now, if you come from a private corporate thing where the expectation is you need to know how the budget impacts your sector, your vertical. Say you come from BFSI. How how has what has what does the budget have for BFSI? Right? If you come from say hospitality sector, what is hard what is hard for the hospitality sector? If you come from oil and gas, what does it have for the oil and gas? So it comes from a vantage point of view where you're coming from, you need to know budgets and its implication on that sector. Right. So these are the same typical sort of questions that you would expect. Right. I think that's that's the last of the comments chats that I see. Uh, now I have, I have raised and Nikuj, yes, you can ask. Oh, I wanted to ask a question regarding like things like uh, in your PPT you had uh, cash politics and all that. Yes. And you know cash politics. If we say mm -hmm. those things in an interview, like can't we be pressed to give examples of that? And won't that lead us to like controversial things? Oh, it, it's all about phrasing. First of all, uh, these were the issues when I said, what are the issues on where Indian elections are occur and uh, people vote on? It's a fair objective fact that Indian elections has a strong identity, caste-based issues, uh, and there is there is enough examples. So if, see, since I've already given you that, you can go and Google some facts around it 
to defend yourself. For example, I don't recall it exactly, but at least in both Madhya Pradesh, uh, in the recent state elections and the elections that happened in Karnataka, ACI recovered some 500 to 600 crores of cash. And very off late, I think I don't remember exactly, but one of the political parties, there was a raid and it took three or four days for people to count the cash that was found at that place, right? So you simply know that it's, it's, it's an undeniable fact that cash and certain uh, financial muscle is used in elections. Someone is unmuted. Yeah, uh, is used in election. So you have to just phrase it that that's one challenge that ECI is facing because it's the real challenge that ECI faces. How do I, how do they track the election spends, right? There is a, on paper, there's a certain limit that they have to adhere to. But it is very clear in large number of cases that limit is not adhered to. There are ways to shift in, there are ways to bend that limit and go beyond that limit, right? And that's a challenge. The second challenge is, of course, that India, despite all, all its progressiveness, still there are parties that are heavily based on single caste that they vote for them. You, if you come from such states, you can give examples. Like if I come from uh, UP, I, I know at least two parties. Uh, in fact, I, I know more than two parties that, that have a strong, a certain a certain segment of population if uh, divided bisected on caste that that uh, is a strong voter base for them so that's why that's a reality and you you could be pressed one or two times on it but not beyond that if you give examples okay yeah again if you're not taking extreme viewpoints uh you you are safe all all you are stating here is facts in a good sugar coated manner that's what you was doing and since i've tell, told you you can go and google around i think karnataka it was 500 or 600 crores of cash even recent state elections eci keeps on recovering cash and see this is recovered money there's more money that is already in use so it was i think in jarvan yeah, i i'm see I'm, I'm not sure but i do remember reading that news that in some state a politician was found with a lot of cash with three days of counting had to happen and sir, I have one last question that uh, yeah. what if we want to uh, avoid uh, such kind of conversation, like if interviewees keep asking us on the topic and if we keep a silence, so yeah. there could be any kind of negative impression, like, or I can say directly that, sir, I don't know about the topic. So, yeah, you can, you can, you can say that uh, I don't strongly read about politics and follow it. Uh, and uh, which is why I might not have complete knowledge of it. And what from whatever I know, here is what my response is, right? So you can clearly you are stating that there is a disinterest uh, in you. Now they might ask you, Ki, why is there a disinterest? Because in general, people expect the youth should be aware about politics. They need to be an active voice. You can say the current political environment is very polarizing or uh, the way I hear about it on social media, it is very polarizing and I feel uh, it's too divided and I don't want to be part of that divided class. So right now I'm more focused on certain other hobbies or interests that I have, which could be business, stock markets, certain sports and other things. And I follow that more religiously than following and spending time and creating interest in that domain. And it's a fair answer. There are a lot of people who are apolitical who have very limited interest in politics and these issues. Like, actually, I want to avoid this question because I am coming from Gujarat. And here is yes. a very basic chance that we are all following the BJP party. That's for sure. No, <laughs> see, whatever party you follow, there is they, they don't care about it. So even if you come yeah. from Gujarat, if even if you come from Gujarat, they might ask you, okay, you guys vote for the BJP. You said, okay, there are certain good things that the BJP has done, which is why a lot of people vote for the BJP. Uh, but that being said, my interest in politics is very limited, and I don't read so actively about it. Uh, so, so I'm not very aware about it. So you can state it in a diplomatic manner. They're not going to judge you that you come from a state which elects. See, people might have an impression that BJP ko support BJP, so negative, there would be negative points. Or you come from a state which elects BJP, that too with a thundering majority always for a very large number of years. No, that doesn't happen. There's this very high wisdom on the panel side to not judge you on that. Uh, what, what, what might create say they won't be what could create negative points is your extreme positions if you are it won't be anything if you come from up bihar or whatever state you come from whichever party they elect people down south from tamil nadu will have their own reasons of there's a very different sort of politics that happen in those states right rahul you can ask your question oh uh, sorry sir i was a little late uh 
Mm -hmm. So I really wanted to ask you that what is the minimum thing we should at least uh, cover up before going up to the interview? Like what are the positions we should cover uh, before? The minimum thing that you need to cover is uh, knowing certain facts about elections with how many seats, how many constituencies, knowing about delimitation, which is bound to happen in a, in two, three years down the line. You need to about, know about major issues, which could be caste census, unemployment, inflation, economy, um, uh, identity politics you also need to know about uh, possibly about the india alliance which is perhaps a new new thing on the cards uh, for for the current political party so these are the some basic things that you are expected to know not in much detail but you need to know and current government's pros and cons what what have they done good in the last 10 years what what is possibly their downsides okay Okay. looks like a very broad thing yeah thank you yeah it's a broad thing I, again it depends if your interview takes that direction expect if sometimes an interview whichever direction it takes and if there is a lot of probing and follow-up that happens it mm -hmm. goes in that direction and it happens for five to ten minutes so that is uh that way you will cover a lot of things most like, of the time there, it doesn't happen it doesn't happen like is there any way if they are entering those mass lines i could like really narrate them out of it by saying something yeah you can you can say that you're not interested in politics you don't read about it so actively so it's not an active area okay. of interest and from whatever you know this is your response that is a clear indication for them to shift gears to something else right like would, but it typically see first of all it won't happen for people who are not uh not interested uh in politics uh they won't be ventured too deep into it but they there are tell me about yourself on this where people will say that they're especially people are interested in geopolitics people are interested in a lot of these affairs and this stated in their tell me about yourself in that case it gets picked it gets picked up and people ask it also i i'm not i won't be surprised that in a large section of this because at least i in my batch I had people from ipac and political consulting that came and sat for mba interviews so now Paul, there are more political consulting firms, not just IPAC. IPAC was run by Prashant Kishor. Now I know there's inclusive minds. There are a lot of other political consulting firms that happen. And if you have work experience in those firms or in policy think tanks and others, definitely mm -hmm. there will be a large section of your interview that will be going go into that. And I won't be surprised that, that people from IPAC and some, because they've the numbers have gone up for these political consulting ones they're not sitting if you come from that background there's expectation that you will be asked and if you don't come from that background you will escape that you won't be asked on it that much mm -hmm. okay okay yes. sir. like i was being wary of the fact that this might pose me as a ignorant kind of person no igno ignorant happens when you're completely clueless about it when you say mm -hmm. i don't even know about it or you plain away say i have no interest i don't even read about it that is a that is an yeah. ignorant yeah. side of it right. having some Thank opinions you, having read it is a yes ashwa magarwal you can ask uh yes sir so uh, this is regarding geopolitics so if we say that we have we like reading about the geopolitics uh will will it cover the indian politics as well or just the international it could politics? it could it could cover but uh, they there might be follow-ups what in geopolitics do you read right and then there will be expectation to know about geopolitics and in that case be prepared for it because the geopolitics is a very wide terms right and people they simply sometimes don't understand this simply say that you know they are interested in geopolitics because they like reading international news. So geopolitics is governed by a lot of factor, right? It is governed by geography. It is governed by economics. It is governed by demo demography uh, in international relations, of course. Geopolitics will never cover domestic. It is Geopolitics is a term used for largely for international and foreign policy issues. But you need to be aware that it is governed by a lot of factors. Know these factors and be aware of certain issues in some more depth. For example, there is an Iran-US thing. There is a Israel-Palestine thing. There is a um, uh, what to say Russia-Ukraine thing. There is a China-US thing. These are all parts of geopolitics, and you need to whatever strand of that geopolitics you are interested in, you need to know about it. Also, they might also ask, what is your motivation? Why are you interested in geopolitics? Exactly, right? Yeah. That okay. Got it. There is one more question. Let me read it. I think it's on the chat. Uh for should we see current on of course you need to know the current, 
lot of current situation have historical his, histories behind it. So not, for example, I will give you just one plain vanilla example. I have, I think I've done 10, 11 mocks till now with, with your batch. Uh, in 50% of those mocks, Maldives issue came out, which is part of geopolitics because it's international relations, uh, a question of geography governed by geography, economics, and many other factors. So it's part of geopolitics straight away, right? A lot of people knew that, okay, there's a pro-China government, uh, Indian military has been asked to go away from, from Maldives and there were social media post account prime minister and, and this and that, right? That is what they knew. But there is a history to it. At least have some, some awareness of it. If you say you are interested in geopolitics, if you've said that, if you have not said that, then it's fine. That, that just shows that you need to be currently aware. But once you say you have an interest in it, that means you need to demonstrate that interest. You need to know that what was the historical precedent that there is an operation cactus for a military coup that was happening in Maldives, which is why military Indian military got stationed in Maldives, uh, right? And and since then it has been stationed for perhaps humanitarian and other needs, but it has been stationed for a reason. It got there for a reason, right? So some historical precedence is also required when you say you are interested in geopolitics not for someone who is not interested it's just asked out of general awareness that also now you don't need to go into depth of chechnya republic and uh, for a russia ukraine thing like don't need to go in that depth also but need to know what are the things yeah you sh you can ignore sri lanka yes and uh, again again uh, who is this random panda whoever is this person if you are if you're telling me about yourself or anywhere in the interview you are the one who are saying you are interested in geopolitics possibly they will ask you why you are interested what in geopolitics are you interested in if sri lanka is not in your domain they might you can ignore it but if you are interested in that domain if you are interested in sri lanka they might press you about the issues of the Sinhalese versus the tamil population and what has been the historical reason uh, uh, situation in that country but unless and until you say you have an active interest. See, uh, what other reasons? I I had an interest in politics and I said it in all my tell me about yourself. I, I gave a reason that uh, I have an interest in politics. It happens to come out of just certain reading and knowing about history regarding, regarding political affairs also politics in general governs a lot of things regarding power uh, policy and whatnot uh, and that is why my own interest uh, is there right some 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 something on that that politics defines policy if if a certain party is part of politics gets elected to government they are the ones who are going to define policies and those policies are going to govern the way we live in this country or wherever we live so that could be a reason for you to be interested in politics right so that is one possible reason i also had a minor in political science uh, or not a minor but i had read a lot of subjects in political science in my undergraduate uh, as an added electives so that that was one other motivation for me to say that i was interested in politics because i read people like christophe jaffarlo uh, to uh, Elias Kaneti, to other uh, Thomas Blom Hensons and others, uh, to Ramachandra Guha, Raj Mohan Gandhi and others who were political historians of India uh, because of two or three electives that I took. So for me, it was a natural tell me about yourself because I wanted follow up questions in that. Okay, thanks. Uh, I was actually coming. In. Okay, that's fine. Uh, not expected to know last last three years per se. As I said, if you're not if you're not saying it that it's your interest, you're not expected to know. What you're expected to know is general awareness. And by general awareness, if I have to put a time cut off, maybe two quarters before your interview, which is six months before your interview, uh, till the time of your interview. That is general awareness that you need to know. And in that event of things, uh, you might we possibly should be aware of israel palestine which is which happened three months back and it's an ongoing thing in terms of certain very big international events that that have had implications across russia ukraine is possibly and us china is possibly the other things that you need to know sri lanka and other issues can be ignored 
China, Taiwan could be an issue. It's, it's also then becomes a part of US China. Again, if it is your inter interest area, you can you can study that. Otherwise, I, as I said, Russia, Ukraine, US China, uh you know you won't be judged. You you won't be judged at all if you're not interested in politics. Uh dok doklam issue. Yeah. So eh, bahut burana ho gaya. Bahut zyada burana ho gaya. it could be part of India, China. Uh, but I think there, there, then there Galwan happened. There's kind of in the Ladakh region and other region. This question will not come unless and until you specifically say you are interested in military history, interested in geopolitics, foreign relations, uh, and you when they ask you certain examples and you yourself put India, China in example, then they might follow you up with that. Otherwise, you won't be asked a lot on India and China and such specific issues like Doklam, Galwan. Uh, and the standoffs that have happened. And since if even if you do normal reading, I, I believe 80% of this crowd will be anyway aware of these issues. In, aware, not not knowing in depth. So as you told, we would say, let me read this. In terms of somewhere, but a counter mission to win, like mine, then how you. Oh man, it's very simple to answer this. Very simple to answer this, Himanshu. Uh, you can say, you're not interested in politics when it comes to deciding your own vote. Uh, you decided on the basis of your own, the constituency, whichever constituency you come from. So, example, I come from the Agra constituency. My home state is Agra from where I vote. So, I, if I say I'm not interested in politics, I do know bits about it from some regular reading of newspapers that I do, but I don't follow it in detail. Uh, and if they follow up on, then how do you vote if you don't know about politics? Is that I'm generally aware of things. Uh, to a minor extent and secondly when it comes to vote i'm very clear i decide on my own constituency of what work my mps are doing and who is the best suited candidate for mps and for that i take informed opinion of my family and friends to go and decide for my own you can just you can just shift it to your constituency now a follow-up to that is who is the mp of your constituency what are some one or two good things he has done likelihood of that follow-up if that person is coming is aware of that constituency or not right for example someone coming from delhi if you say I vote for my constituency, they might ask you about Delhi constituency because Delhi sometimes jumps to national stage when it comes to their events and other things, their policies and other issues, because there's a different state government, there's a different national MPs that get elected. You could be asked, but in general, then I need to do a certain Googling of being aware of what my MP has done in the last five years. Who is my MP also? That needs to be known. But you can safely say I'm not interested in politics. Based on the work my MP does, I elect, I go and vote for him or her, whatever it's in the case. That way you escape that loop of politics. Okay, any more questions? I don't think so. We, as usual, we have run much beyond our schedule time. Uh, but thank you everyone for joining. Uh, and good best of luck best of luck with your interviews thank you